Hey everyone, uh, welcome and good evening from the island where students are tuning into this talk from the various classes and places around the island and welcome to all of the folks who are joining us from off the island. We're, we're really happy to have you here for our second rock talk of this summer. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Jennifer Seavey, the Executive Director of Shoals Marine Lab. And Shoals is the largest and the oldest undergraduate focused marine lab in the country. And if you're not on this island and you're wondering where we are, we are about 10 miles offshore of Portsmouth. And we are jointly operated by UNH and Cornell. So every summer we host this marine seminar series that we call Rock Talks. And um, we are excited this summer to be continuing to host them on Zoom. So I'm glad you all are here. So our format is for a 45 minute talk followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. If you wanna ask a question at any time, please use that Q&A button that's at the bottom of the screen and type it in. And then I'll read the questions at the end to Dr. Mercer and she will answer them. And I wanna let you know right up front that she actually said, if we run out of time, she put your questions in there anyway and she'll answer them later. So she has graciously agreed to do that, which is great. If you have any technical problems, Colin Love is on this line too, and you can use the Q&A and just write in what you're having trouble with and he'll help you with that. So our speaker tonight is Dr. Anna Mercer. She has had a long career focused on expanding fishermen's involvement with scientific data collection and application. And she does this work in her uh, current position as the chief of the cooperative research branch at NOAA's Northeast Fisheries Science Center, a great place for all of those fishery students to be thinking about future jobs. And maybe some of the parasite students, as I will get to in a second. Anna is a true Maina. She grew up in Maine, so she has uh, the cred, as they say, um, for this work especially. Um, she has an undergraduate degree in marine biology from UNH, a PhD in biological oceanography from the University of Rhode Island, a little shout out to Jackie Webb, who I know is on this call from the University of Rhode Island. So Anna was a Shoals Marine Lab um, intern, and she worked with April, who is on island right now in the parasite class. And she hammered many a snails, comparing the densities of the birds and the crabs and the snails and the parasites. And she actually, this is inspiration, she published a paper out of that work. And it actually also served as her senior thesis at UNH. So she got a lot out of that experience here. She also, just as a side note, met her life partner on this island, which I just found out. So uh, that's a fun possibility here at Shoals Marine Lab as well. So she's here tonight to talk to us about cooperative research, engaging fishermen to advance science and sustainability. So Anna, take it away. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much, Jen. Can everyone hear me? Sounds great. Excellent. And can you see my screen? Yes. All Thanks. right. Look at this technology working in my favor for once in my life. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Of course, I wish that I weren't in my basement. Um, I wish I were on the island with, with all of you or for those of you who are out on the island. I'm very jealous of those of you who are out there. As Jen mentioned, it's a very special place uh, in my career as well as in my personal life, as is where I met my husband. Um, but today I'm here to talk to you about cooperative research, kind of what I have built my career on and how engaging fishermen inform science and um, how we support sustainable fisheries in this country in particular. So before I dive into kind of the, the science and the different projects that I work on and who I work for, NOAA's Northeast Fisheries Science Center, I thought I'd just kind of walk through my path um, through my career. Since a lot of you who are listening in are probably at the point I was at when I was at Shoals Marine Lab, um, I have always really enjoyed hearing people's career stories. I still do now. Um, and so humor me as I walk, take you on a, um, a little tale, a little, a little path through um, my, uh, my career. 
So as hopefully I can get these slides to advance. Maybe. There we go. Yay. All right. So I, as Jen mentioned, I got some grit. I did um, I did grow up in Maine and not just in Maine, but in central Maine. Um, so I am a true Mainer, if you will, not from Portland or South. We don't consider those real Mainers. Any real Mainers out there, give me a shout out. Um, you can see where I'm from, that little uh, the star right in the middle of the, the state of Maine, little town, tiny town called Norwich Walk, um, where obviously I did not grow up on the coast. So I did not have that immediate connection necessarily to the ocean, um, but I did have the fortune of spending quite a bit of time on the lakes and in the rivers in central Maine. I was um, what they call a water baby, you know, had to pull me out kicking and screaming every time um, we were out on the water, whether it were on a boat or on our canoe or on our kayaks or, or just floating, just floating in the river. I was very lucky and later in my childhood, about my mid childhood to begin to spend some time on in coastal Maine. So you can see the star there on the map um, that's on Peaks Island, which is a little island in Casco Bay right off of Portland, Maine. Um, and once I got my, my hands on the creatures and the tide pools, um, that connection never went away. I was intrigued of every, all the different forms of life were there from the seaweed to the snails, to the, to the crabs, to the lobsters, to the little rock gunnels, everything just fascinated me. I learned to hum snails out of their shells at a very young age, which stuck with me for a very long time. I have now taught my own children to do that. And had a really um, strong connection to the ocean from, from that age on. So when it came time for me to decide when I was in high school what I was going to do, it wasn't a hard choice for me. I knew I wanted to do something with the ocean. What that something was, I didn't know. So I needed a program that was going to help steer me um, and help me find my place in, in ocean science. And the place that I chose to go was the University of New Hampshire which I hope some of you are also students of. And when I was at UNH, of course, I took all the coursework in marine sciences, um, but I also really focused on getting experiences in research. Um, so I um, kind of got some experience in pure oceanography or physical oceanography at the Ocean Process Analysis Lab, spending time in the Gulf Challenger and in the lab um, processing CDOM samples or colored dissolved organic matter samples that we would filter from the Gulf of Maine. I spent time working at the Center for Freshwater Biology, so carrying canoes up mountains and doing transects on canoes across um, mountain lakes. Um, and I spent time at the Jackson Estuarine Lab, particularly um, looking with my th senior thesis, working with snails and um, understanding how trematodes in impact their life cycle. Um, I also had the fortune of working for the Seacoast Science Center where um, I got a lot of experience with science communication and education. And um, if you take one thing away from this, you know, I, I encourage you all as you move into your science careers to never forget about sharing your science. It's one of the most important things we can do as scientists is um, not just share our science with our peers, but share the science with, with those who you can help inspire and help inform, particularly in, in this day and age when there's, it's easy to get information on the web, but it might not, might not always be accurate information. So um, I encourage you all to think about including a science communication or education component as, as you move forward. I certainly enjoyed my time um, at the Seacoast Science Center. So a couple of years into my undergraduate career, I decided to spend some time abroad in a study abroad program and wanted to think about a place where I could go to kind of further my horizons and in, in um, ocean sciences and marine biology. Um, I also wanted to get um, a more diverse cultural experience. So I ended up studying abroad for six months in Zanzibar, Tanzania, which is a little tiny island off the east coast of Africa. Um, and while I was there, I had the chance to learn a lot about the Indian Ocean and the ecosystems in the Indio Indian Ocean. But this is where I made the connection between science and people. And that is something that stuck with me throughout my entire career, and I will say has shaped my entire career. This is where I learned and saw um, from the people that I lived with and, and worked with and broke bread with um, that the ocean is not just something that we recreate on. It's not just something that we like looking at, not just something we like um, collecting creatures from. Um, it's a source of food. It is a source of um, livelihood and it supports the culture of um, here in the US but across the world of thousands and millions of people in coastal communities. And this is where I decided this is what I want to do. This is where this is where I want to go in my career is doing science um, that 
ensures that their oceans continue to prosper and support all of these communities and these cultures throughout the world. So when I went back to UNH, um, I said, all right, if I want to do science and I want to do ocean science, I got to do some research. I got to do some research and I got to learn how to do it independently. And this is where Shoals Marine Lab comes in. I was really fortunate to have a wonderful advisor at UNH, Jeb Byers, um, who's down at UGA now, University of Georgia in Athens. Um, and I was the parasite intern or one of them, um, one of April's students as well. Um, Carrie was also on, on the island doing crab parasites at the time, but I spent my time on, on the island, as you can see in these photos, collecting snails, painting snails, hammering cages into the inner tidal at 3 a.m., um, collecting the snails again, dissecting the snails, uh, many of the things that some of you might be working on now. And it's where I learned how to do science, is where I learned about experimental design and the importance of a rigorous experimental design. It's where I learned about the importance of data management. This is where I learned the importance of neat handwriting if you're going to write it down. Um, and it's where I learned those practical skills of how to manage data, even if it's just an Excel sheet, how you take care of data, identify outliers, and how you analyze that data to come to a, a conclusion. So it was a really formative experience for me um, in, my, um, in my professional career. And I did also meet my husband there. So I guess my, my, um, my, my, personal, my personal life as well. All right, so I graduated from the University of New Hampshire with a, um, a major in marine and freshwater biology. And in thinking of what I wanted to do after college, I said, I'm not exactly sure. So I took that year to work. So I spent about half the year out on the island of Nantucket um, working with their bay scallop industry. You can see base, the many bay scallops that I measured up there in the top um, where I was doing research on the habitat dynamics as well as um, the predator um, predator prey relationships between scallops of various life stages and, and their predators within Nantucket Harbor. Um, this was my first direct experience working with the fishing community, particularly in this region, in the Northeast region. Um, a lot of the research we were doing out on Nantucket was directly used to manage that fishery, a very small but very lucrative fishery. Um, they're very valuable, the, fish, the, the Nantucket Bay Scallop fishery, although it's a small fishery, is incredibly valued because of the value of that, of that species. So it's my first um, and inspiring experience of doing research that had an impact on how the people who are harvesting that resource um, um, were able to do so and able to do so sustainably and now over time continued. I spent the second half of that year down in the Netherland Antilles in Bonaire at the CIEE research station in Bonaire, where I did a lot of research um, on coral reef ecology, particularly on sedimentation, as well as some artisanal fishery research. Um, did a lot of scuba diving. I um, highly recommend if you'd like to go scuba diving going to Bonaire. Um, but I learned coral reef research wasn't really for me. And it was a really important learning experience for me. Yes, I love scuba diving and um, I loved living on a, a tropical island, but it didn't have that connection that I was looking for back with the people um, and back with the management of the resource. Um, so after my um, year of working, this really helped me to decide where I wanted to go with graduate school. And so I ended up at the University of Rhode Island Graduate School of Oceanography. Um, where my research focused on understanding um, the impacts of um, offshore wind energy development on um, fishery ecosystem dynamics, including the three circles you see there. So everything from the fish community biogeography, so where are the fish, um, went out and did a lot of surveys with trawls and dredges and traps, every type of fishing gear you could think of, um, to see what fish were where and how many of them and how big are they and how many eggs do they have in them, et cetera. Um, I also looked at their habitat and what their habitat looks like now versus what it might look like if and when offshore wind energy moved forward, which now we know is a when because it is moving forward. Um, I used acoustic techniques. What you're looking at there on the um, left in the middle, that really beautiful rainbow is actually an acoustic image of the seafloor. And the yellow line is a toe that we did, a bottom trawl. And as well as using video technology, which you can see a snippet of there on the bottom left. And then finally, I looked at trophic dynamics. So I got back to the microscope 
couldn't stay away. Um, this time, looking at guts, looking at uh, fish guts. So cut open a whole bunch, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of fish stomachs, as well as used um, stable isotopes as a technique to understand the look longer term trends in fish diet. So this experience with graduate school um, threw me full fledged into co-op, what I call cooperative research. And that is working with the fishing industry to develop science questions, to develop the approaches to address those science questions, of course, guided by experimental design, um, and then engaging them in the, in the interpretation of the results. Um, so every piece of field research I did was on a fishing boat. Um, by myself or with some of my colleagues. Um, and I had about 10 fishermen who came to my defense. Um, so it was where I developed those relationships and developed a technique to answer really important science questions while engaging those who that science ultimately is going to impact as the harvesters. So I received a PhD in fisheries oceanography from the URI Graduate School of Oceanography um, and then moved on to work in the nonprofit sector. So I was the executive director of the, a nonprofit called the Commercial Fisheries Research Foundation, which focuses on engaging fishermen in the scientific process. Um, you can see lots of pictures of me working with fishermen in different ways here, whether it's giving them technology to collect data themselves, like in the top left, um, having them show me where they catch the fish and me turning in that, in that into a data and a research product, you go, such as the top right, and then going out to sea on their boats and doing surveys to see, in this case, lobster in the bottom right there. Where are they? Where are they going? Tag them and see where they go. And, and what does that mean for other uses of the ocean and how many should be extracted? So I developed a lot of experience um, in this position um, with all different types of cooperative research with different species and different approaches. Um, after several years in that position, I moved into the position that I am in now as the chief of the cooperative research branch at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. Um, and I do very similar work now as I did in my previous position, except that I work for the federal agency that is responsible for ensuring that the fisheries um, that we execute in this country are sustainable and that we're protecting the resources and conserving the ocean environment um, within our, our federal waters. So I continue to work directly hand in hand um, with the fishing industry, which you hear a little bit more about as I go into some of the projects. So before I dive into kind of uh, the, the rest of um, some of the research that I've been working on recently, the different types of cooperative research we've been doing, I wanted to get us all on the same page. Some of you are in the sustainable fisheries class, so you might already know this. So you guys can go ahead and tune out or quiz yourself. Uh, see if you did already know this. And if you did great, good job to your your um, your teachers, Owen and Lindsay, I believe, for, for teaching you all this already. But I wanna get us all on the same playing field. So to start a fishery. It's all just getting the same page about what a fishery is. A fishery is harvesting aquatic animals for either commercial, recreational, or subsistence purposes. So commercial fishery, you harvest it, you get paid for it, and then you sell it to someone else. That's a commercial fishery that can be of any size. It can be a couple hundred pounds a year to many millions. Um, recreational fishery, you go out to catch a, a fish or a squid or whatever it might be for fun, for the recreational value of it. And then subsistence fishery, um, or as a fishery where you're harvesting that 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 animal or, or those organisms to feed yourself, to feed your family, or to feed your community. Um, but it's not a, um, a commercial, at, not at a commercial value, at a subsistence level to, to um, support, support your community. It's very important to note that a fishery is not just fish. <laughs> a fishery is any um, aquatic animal that you can harvest either from the oceans as well as from, from uh, freshwater systems. We do have many freshwater fisheries. Um, our agency, NOAA, has um, a very large Great Lakes research program and uh, management program for Great Lakes fisheries. So it's not just oceans, it's also lakes and rivers um, and freshwater systems. And this is my buddy Calvin, who I work with. He is wonderful. Those are herring that you see him standing in. That's a whole bunch of herring. Um, this is in the Gulf of Maine. All right. 
So back to kind of how I got tied in here. Now, we all know what a fishery is, um, but the reason that I stay engaged in fisheries is because um, we're doing research and we're doing science that's, like, like I said, not just going into a journal to just inform how we understand the world, which is valuable, um, but it's supporting a global food source. The research that we, that we do ensures that we have this huge food source that is renewable and unique and healthy for the entire world. And so globally, if you look globally, what you're looking at here is a map of the world, hope you recognize that, um, where the colors represent the fishing yield. So how many fish or other marine organisms are taken out of the coastal oceans or in the, any part of the oceans in this case, in each of these areas. And you'll see the, the darker colors you see, the reds um, are where more yield or more ant organisms are extracted. And for those of you who are oceanography geeks like me, you'll notice that some of those areas are a lot of upwelling, upwelling regions um, that have really high productivity. So I'm not gonna dive into oceanography because that's a whole nother talk. Um, but just to note that there's a reason that there are you know, these areas um, off of South America, off of Chile and Peru, as well as off of Namibia that are um, highly productive and has to do with upwelling. So globally, um, about 3 billion people rely on seafood as their primary source of protein. It is not small, it is, it is not, we're not talking a little bit of food here. We're talking about a lot of people a lot, of, a lot of fish and other species that, that feed those people. Um, in 2018, um, about 96 million tons of seafood were harvested globally. Um, and that um, supports about 260 million people with jobs. So um, fisheries and the science we do to inform fisheries management and um, harvesting of seafood is is supporting a global our global economy um, and is supporting um, people in terms of giving them sustainable and healthy protein as well. So zooming in a little bit to the US since we are here in the US and the agency I work for um, focuses on, on the US. Um, here in the US, um, our commercial fisheries harvest about 9.3 billion pounds of seafood every year, which is a worth, a worth about five and a half billion dollars. So again, not small pennies here. It's a lot of, um, a lot um, of resource that we're taking out of the ocean and a lot of um, economic kind of productivity that comes from that. And um, all of the coasts across the U.S. have fisheries, every single one. So you can see the map there in the middle. These are the regions that we as an agency, NOAA, um, that we, we study and we manage. The Northeast here in the green or the Atlantic, Gulf of Mexico, um, West Coast region, the Alaskan region, and then the Pacific Islands. All of these areas have um, both commercial and strong commercial and recreational fisheries. The highest volume port in our nation, so the port, the fishing port in, in our nation that brings in the most, the largest amount of fish in terms of pounds is Dutch Harbor, Alaska. I don't know if there's any Alaskans out there, if anyone who's been to Alaska, but if you haven't, you got to go because it's amazing. I went for the first time a couple of years ago, pre-COVID. And the reason that that port is the highest volume port, Dutch Harbor, is primarily due to this guy here. I don't think you can see my cursor, but this is an Alaskan Pollock. That's what's in your fish sticks. It's what's in a lot. It's, it's what's in your um, your uh, California roll, um, your imitation crab stick, etc. It is the highest volume fishery in the entire nation. However, um, it is not the highest value. That belongs here in the Northeast in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Um, and that is in large part due to this little guy here, the Atlantic Sea Scallop. It's not a bay scallop. These are the big guys that live offshore in deep water and grow large, the ones you will see on your plate that are larger, um, that are larger in size. And that fishery is worth about $450 million um, almost alone. All right. Um, however, I'm here in the Northeast. I don't want to lead you to believe that the only fishery we have is the scallop fishery. In the Northeast and across the nation, we have incredibly diverse fisheries here in the Northeast. So when I say Northeast, I'm thinking um, Maine all the way down to the Carolinas. Um, we harvest, our fishing communities harvest, and we manage nearly 200 different species. So you can see just, just a handful of them or more here on the 
the slide, redfish and herring and mahi and pollock and scallops and butterfish and clams and lungfish and squid, all sorts of different um, um, different fish and, and invertebrates that we harvest here in the Northeast. But they are not all created equal in terms of how many of them we harvest and what they're worth. Um, so what you're looking at here is just a simple bar graph um, of the landings for the top 10 species in the Northeast. So the highest volume fishery, the fishery where we harvest the most in terms of the quantity or pounds is our menhaden fishery here, but it's not worth very much. You see that small little green bar, that's the value. So it's only worth about, um, um, about 50 million, which is that much compared to a lot of the other fisheries, um, is completely outcompeted here in terms of value by the largest and the most valuable fishery in the nation, the American lobster fishery, as well as the sea scallop fishery that I mentioned. So I just wanted to give you a sense that we have many, many different fisheries, but they vary in time in in over the years in terms of how much they're worth and how much we harvest for each of those depending on how much we allow um, fishermen to take out and how much is available to them in terms of what the ecosystem is producing so in addition to um money and jobs um and food Fisheries also have cultural value, which I've mentioned several times. And so what you're looking at here is a, a map of all the fishing ports across the, um, at least the northern portion of the Northeast region here, um, about mid coast Maine down to Northern New Jersey. There's over 40 fishing ports in the Northeast region from Maine to North Carolina. Um, if you haven't been to a fishing port, I hope you get to one. And if you do go to a fishing port, make sure you walk out onto the docks. Um, check out some of the boats. Talk to some of the fishermen. See if they're selling anything. Um, what you see here on the bottom right is actually my daughter, who is now five years old. Um, Maeve is her name, walking down on the docks in Point Judith, Rhode Island. And in many different ways, fisheries provide cultural value of um, heritage, of fishing heritage, um, and in coastal communities that are really built upon the foundation of of commercial fisheries. So I would, didn't want to um, didn't want to leave this piece of fisheries off off of the table when we're talking about it today. All right, so who's responsible for all these fisheries? How the heck do we have all these fisheries? How do we make sure that we just don't catch all of them and that there's none left going forward? Well, many, 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 many different groups play a role in that, particularly here in the US. We have um, the federal agency that I work for, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, we have state agencies that help manage and study fisheries. We have a lot of academics. We have a lot of nonprofits. And of course, our stakeholders, the commercial um, and recreational fishermen, as well as all the businesses that support them. So everyone plays a part in making sure our fisheries here in the U.S. are sustainable. Um, but particularly at NOAA, um, it is our mission as a federal agency, your tax dollars or your parents' tax dollars support the agency. That's who pays me um, and the many other people that work for NOAA. We are responsible. We are the federal agency that is responsible for ensuring that this nation has productive and sustainable sustainable fisheries, a safe source of seafood, so a healthy and safe source of seafood, there are, that we are recovering, recovering and conserving our protected resources, our marine mammals and sea turtles and seabirds, and healthy ecosystems and balanced ecosystems. Um, and all of this and all in our mission is backed by science, which is why as, as a scientist, um, I have now come to work uh, for this agency. The agency, in, in terms of NOAA and NOAA Fisheries, we have over 4,000 employees. So we have a lot um, of different scientists and managers that work for the agency. You can see some of the type of research um, that, that my colleagues and myself do. Surveys, population biology, stock assessments, ecosystem science, social sciences, protective species research, aquaculture, and of course, cooperative research. And we have um, six science centers across, uh, across the country. So I work for the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, but we also have a southeast, oh, I didn't put them all on there, apologies, southeast, southwest, northwest Alaska, Alaska and Pacific Islands Science Center. So we are across the nation, but geographically um, focused. All right, so here, zooming in even a little bit more to the northeast, what you're looking at here is a schematic of the northeast um, continental shelf ecosystem, as well as our offshore ecosystem in the Gulf Stream. So those of you who have any have some oceanographic background will, will recognize some, some of the oceanographic features in this, in this schematic, the Gulf Streams, that big beltway of warm water that brings the warm water from um, 
the from the tropics um, makes us warm enough, at least really warm this last week. <laughs> That wasn't due to the Gulf Stream, but it is what makes this area of uh, the country gives us the environment that we have. Um, you'll see Nantucket Shoals and George's Bank, the Mid-Atlantic Bight, a feature called the Cold Pool. And we at the Northeast Fishery Science Center are responsible for doing the research. So conducting ecosystem-based research um, on all the living marine resources in this area in order to promote their recovery if they are depleted and the long-term sustainability of those resources and species so that we can generate both social and economic opportunities and benefits for the coastal communities that rely upon them, including the fishing community. So I put a few statistics down there at the bottom about um, what that looks like, how many stocks we manage and how many trips we do to sea every year and how many algal cultures we grow for aquaculture, et cetera. We do a wide variety of different work in the Northeast, but with this focus on supporting sustainable fisheries um, and conserving protected species and habitats. All right. So Coming in more to my lane of what I focus on now, um, I am the chief of the cooperative research branch and our mission in cooperative research is to work in collaboration with the fishing community to improve our understanding of the ocean ecosystem, to support sustainable fisheries, the fisheries that those individuals rely upon for their livelihood, and to build trust um, with them, which is key in this case to getting reliable, uh, reliable science that informs the management of these resources. And there are many ways um, that we do that within the cooperative research branch. And there are many others across the region who also do cooperative research. I should mention that um, we are the agency, we are the group within NOAA that focuses on cooperative research, but there are many nonprofits and academics and, and um, state agencies that also do cooperative research. And some of the examples of specific cooperative research are listed here and I'll dive into those a little bit more um, in a couple of slides. So cooperative research has kind of a spectrum of involvement. When I say cooperative research, I'm, I'm not just saying we're going to call up that fisherman and go out in his boat if I need to collect a water sample or I need to collect a fish, although that is one way that we engage with the fishing community. But the goal of cooperative and collaborative research is to develop those relationships with the industry, to have those conversations with them, to help us ask the right questions, to observe what's happening out there on the ocean, them being out there almost every day of the year and across the whole continental shelf. Um, tell us what's happening so we know what to study, where we can focus our resources um, and our research efforts to answer the questions we really need to in order to inform sustainable management of the resources they depend upon. So there's everything, um, you can see the spectrum here of cooperative or collaborative research, everything from informing, you know, them giving us insight, um, all the way to full collaboration of, like I said, from start to finish, identifying the research question, developing the project, going to sea or wherever it might be, maybe it's in a processing facility to collect that data, working it up and making sense of it. That is the full um, spectrum of collaboration. Ultimately, what that looks like in practice um, with cooperative research is engaging fishermen in every um, every step or every component of fisheries. So um, we engage them. You can see a picture up here on the top left in collecting data. Um, we do this in the cooperative research branch with our study fleet program. There are many other programs um, across the region that give fishermen the tools to collect data themselves then come to us as science scientists and we use to understand the ecosystem and those species. So these are some fishermen collecting um, data for the lobster and Jonah crab research fleet. Um, this is in this is in uh, the Gulf of Maine, offshore in the Gulf of Maine. They're working on lobster there. You can see this this guy right here is collecting the data on a tablet and once that data is collected pops up to us um, over the magic of the internet. Um, we also try to engage industry in assessment. So this is us, you know, doing math. <laughs> science is, is math. There's a lot of math in science. Um, and that can be something that's difficult to communicate and, and get on the same page with when you're working with, with members of the fishing industry. But we put a lot of effort into trying to explain what we're doing with the data that we collect either alongside them or that they collect. Um, so they can help us um, use the right techniques and make the right assumptions when we're doing that math. And in this case, assessments, assessing how much of a species or a stock is out there in the ocean. 
We involved them in the management process. So this is Senator Jack Reed, who's um, a Rhode Island senator, and Captain Jimmy Rule, who's a captain of the fishing vessel, the Durana R, um, directly having them interact, um, not just with senators, um, but also with fisheries managers who are making decisions about, based upon science, um, what management in, um, what management approaches should be used. And then finally, which I'll speak to in a couple of slides, we engage them while they're fishing. So one of the big things that we do is, is give them tools to fish smarter. Fish smarter, not harder. Um, fishermen don't want to have to spend a lot of time wading through species that they don't want to have caught. Um, they want to be as efficient as possible um, and as targeted as possible. So there's a whole body of cooperative research called conservation gear engineering where engineers, really it's engineers and behavioral scientists, fisheries, fisheries behavioral scientists, develop new gear that fishes cleaner, um, that fishes more selectively um, for fishermen to use. All right, so those are some kind of some examples of cooperative research, more of which I list here, everything from surveys to um, fisherman-led data collection, conservation gear engineering, gear engineering, I mentioned, collecting samples while they're at sea, genetics research, collecting their knowledge. This is a big one we're working more on recently is collecting the traditional or local ecological knowledge of fishermen who've been out there for 40 years um, and quantifying that, taking that information and that knowledge and quantifying that to inform um, the science that we do and then the management decisions that are made. And then, of course, in understanding impacts of climate change and socioeconomics and oceanography, as well as the processing and marketing side of fisheries, which is incredibly important, but really just um, coming to the forefront in terms of being integrated in the way that we manage our fisheries. All right, so I just have, a, uh, I think, three um, examples, very specific examples of cooperative research projects that are happening right now that um, the group I work with here, the cooperative research branch is spearheading um, to give you a, 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 a more tangible sense of what it looks like in practice to do cooperative research. So one of our largest projects that we have is a survey. So it's called the Cooperative Gulf of Maine Bottom Longline Survey. It's a survey that's conducted in the Gulf of Maine. You can see the map here um, on the bottom right. Um, the red are the strata, or those are the regions that we survey. Um, the yellow and green indicate hard and smooth bottom, and we select our sampling stations based upon those, um, those habitat types. And the goal here was to be able to do a survey that samples fish that are hard to get to with other types of gear, particularly bottom trawls, which is how we typically would survey for fish. So this survey was started in 2014 and we work collaboratively with um, a group of fishermen. Um, we now um, run the survey off of two fishing vessels, the fishing vessel Mary Elizabeth and Tenacious II. Um, and we work to develop the approach for this survey and then ultimately implement this survey. And the results from this survey, so going out and catching fish basically in a whole bunch of different locations and measuring those fish and taking their gonads and looking at their otoliths to see how old they are, little ear bones or otoliths, those of you who don't know what they are. Um, we use that information for stock assessments as well as um, for other um, for other purposes. So we use that trend and how many of each species is in each area to understand um, how we should manage those fisheries. Um, and we also use you know, the different habitat traits to understand how many of each fish in which habitat and how do we manage those, um, manage those, those resources in those habitats um, wisely. Um, so this is our Gulf of Maine bottom longline survey. You can see Jack here measuring an Atlantic cod on a measuring board. We recently developed some electro electronic technology in order to get us into the into the modern age here to collect that data. But he's um, he's on board one of our partner fishing vessels here as the sun sets. There are some perks. <laughs> All right, so the next project I quickly just wanted to walk through to give you another example is the study fleet. Um, the study fleet is, is an example of um, working with industry to develop the tools, to give them the tools to collect the data themselves. So this last project, um, we go to sea on commercial fishing vessels and they help us do the survey, but ultimately it's our scientists, it's Jack and others who are collecting that data. They're going out to sea on it to sample every single station and collect very detailed information. Whereas the study fleet, um, we are simply developing the tools and giving them to a fleet of fishermen and saying, can you collect this data for us when you're out there? We don't need to be with you. Just tell us what you're seeing. 
and it helps us quantify that. Scientists love numbers. We love numbers and lots of numbers and lots of data. And that's what this program gets us. So the program was started in about 2007. It has about 50 um, participants from Maine down to the Carolinas. Um, and they use kind of the system that you see outlined here on the top. They have a computer in their wheelhouse. And on that computer, they have a specialized piece of software called Flounders, or the Fishery Logbook Data Recording Software. We also love acronyms, lots of acronyms. Um, and that piece of software connects to a depth sensor, their depth sensor on their boat. It connects to their GPS. So we know where they're fishing and they enter information about what they caught. So they tell us how much they caught of what species and what they did with it. Did they keep it or did they throw it back? And we use that information to understand where they're fishing, how that might be impacted by other ocean uses, such as offshore wind, um, as well as um, what that means for trends in that stock over time. So are they fishing differently when there's there are fewer of those animals in the ocean or when there's more of them in there? So we use it in different ways. You can see a map of the coverage of our study fleet or, or the fishing vessels that are collecting this data for us here. Um, the blue all the way to the yellow represents the number of hauls or fishing toes that we get data from annually. Um, so you can see we have coverage all the way from Gulf of Maine down to off of New Jersey. Um, and just here on the bottom, what I'm showing you is one example of how we use this information. These are actually, um, you have to squint really hard to see these, but as an example, um, these are each, each box is a year. And the points you're looking at are how many squid um, were caught by a one fishing boat and one individual haul throughout the season, the fishing season. Squid is one of our highest volume fisheries here in southern New England. Um, and you'll see in the different years, it has a different shape. And so we can learn things about how that fishery is performing and how we should manage that fishery, depending on the shape of, of what we call the landings or the catch, in this case, catch per unit effort. So that's what you're looking at here. And it's a way that we've recently used this information to directly inform the management of the species. All right, so moving into my last um, kind of tangible example here, conservation gear engineering. Um, bottom trawl is by far the most common fishing, um, fishing gear or fishing technology used to harvest fish here in, uh, on the East Coast, but also across the world, uh, across the world and globally. Um, basically, what it looks like is fishermen have a net that they uh, deploy off the back of their boat. Is connected to these two little, um, they're not little in real life, they're big and heavy. They're called doors. They act as kites and kind of pull that net apart once it's um, on the seafloor or close to the seafloor. And they drag that along slowly and collect the fish that are in that area in that time. Um, there are all different size of trawlers, you know, small boats that go out for a day um, to these big gigantic ones. This is the Durston out of New Jersey, Cape May, New Jersey, here on the bottom. Um, she's a freezer trawler and um, she freezes all the, in this case, the squid and mackerel that she, she catches while she's at sea. However, you can imagine when you are trawling um, in the ocean, you might catch things you don't want. And so there's a large body of research that's been going on for, for a couple of decades or longer and is still ongoing to develop novel technology for the bottom trawl fishery to make it more sustainable, to help those fishermen not catch sea turtles, to not catch the species they don't want or the species that are of concern, for example, Atlantic cod that they're constrained by. They can't catch very many of those or any of them, um, depending on where they're fishing. And so here's a few examples. What you see here on the bottom left is, is what's called the eliminator trawl. Um, and this trawl, this is one of the most successful examples of conservation gear engineering where um, what they did was develop a new type of bottom trawl that reduced the bycatch of, of cod by about 95% for they were trying to harvest other species and didn't want to catch cod because you can't catch that many cod and the species is in decline. And so they developed this gear that has huge panels in which cod can swim through, but other species will not because of their behavior, as well as rock hoppers here in the bottom so that that trawl doesn't impact the seafloor, disturb the habitat as much as a traditional bottom trawl. Um, there's also an example here on the top right of a turtle excluder device in, in the summer flounder or fluke fishery. So no one wants to catch a turtle, no way. Um, and so this is an example of developing a tool so the fishermen don't, don't catch turtles. They, let them, they can swim right through and they're very, very effective. Those are actually mandatory in many areas, particularly in the mid-Atlantic. 
and down the Gulf of Mexico and other areas. And then finally, in the last example, this funnel escape to reduce um, the bycatch of butterfish, which is what we call choke species, a species you don't want to catch a lot of in the squid fishery. So they want to catch those squid. They don't want to catch butterfish. They know they intermingle. How do we not catch the butterfish? We understand how they behave. We think as engineers, how can we not catch them to develop gears um, such as this funnel escape bottom trawl? So these are examples of using the engineering and kind of behavioral approach to making fishing more sustainable. All right. So there are many ways to work with fishermen to understand our ocean ecosystems to sustain fisheries. We can work with them to ask the right questions, develop hypotheses. We can work with them to collect data, interpret data, develop new gear and inform management. And ultimately what this results in um, are healthy ocean ecosystems as well as vibrant fishing communities um, and global food security. All of those things is where we can land if we have sound science um, that informs um, rigorous and adaptive management of our fisheries resources. And so with that, I will stop and I would be more than happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Wow, that was awesome. Thank you so much, Anna, for that. I learned a lot. Um, all right, we have some questions. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. I'll get to these ones in chat too, but if you have any other further questions, put them in Q&A. So um, the first question is, are squid in any danger of being overfished in the Gulf of Maine? Definitely not. <laughs> so I'm doing a lot of research on squid right now. We have two major um, species of squid here in the Northeast Gulf of Maine, all the way down to the Mid-Atlantic. We have short fin squid and we have long fin squid. Um, neither of those species is in any danger of being overfished or of overfishing occurring, um, primarily because a very small portion of that, those squids um, habitats or where they live is actually accessible to the fishery. Um, so our short fin squid fishery, about 1% um, of their habitat is actually available to the fishery in terms of it being accessible, being on, in this case, on the continental shelf. They actually spawn offshore, they live offshore for most of the year out of an area the fishermen can't access, it's too far offshore. Um, so for both of those species, they're in no danger of, of being overfished. It's actually quite the opposite. They're considered an underexploited species. They're also a short-lived species. So in, in fishery science and in fisheries biology, we have kind of a range of types of species, ones that we consider more resilient to fishing pressure that um, that have higher levels of fecundity. So they, they reproduce really quickly and multiple times a year, that's squid. Um, they have multiple cohorts within a year, um, live for about six months, produce more of them. So if you don't catch them, they're gonna die and go feed the seals. Um, so the squid fisheries are one that we know very, we. Um, recently have been starting to exploit them more, but because of where they are and how we harvest them, they're at very low risk of ever becoming overfished, um, particularly in this region. That's not the case for other areas throughout the world. Squid fisheries throughout the world are quite um, quite diverse, but in this region, they are um, in, no, in no danger of being overfished. Excellent. All right. Well, you're going to know that this the fishery students are in the house right now. Um, the next question is, in the bottom long line surveys, how did you account for the discrepancies in the stock assessments, such as only catching a select number of fish in an area due to the number of hooks on the line or a fraction of the actual fish population or where only actual fraction of the population is caught? Sorry. Okay, so if I understand the question correctly, how do you round up? <laughs> how do you expand what you're seeing on your hooks to what you think is in the entire environment? Yeah. Um, so all of our surveys, this is a really important thing to uh, take away, are measures of relative abundance, not absolute abundance. Relative abundance is us looking over time. How many of them have we caught in our survey over the years? What is that telling us about trends in that species over time? How many relative to the other years? We're not taking that survey data to say, there are a hundred million halibut 
in the Gulf of Maine. That is not something that we do. Um, so we use surveys, particularly the bottom long line survey to understand trends over time in those different stocks, particularly in the areas where the survey, the survey is. We use other data sources and other tools to understand how many of each species are in those other regions in the Gulf of Maine. Only in order to get a, a measure of absolute abundance, you have to know how many you're missing. And so there are, which gets to your question of how do you how do you go from how many you see in your hooks to how many are out there? It's very difficult to do with um, with fixed gear. However, you can use video techniques so you can see how many fish are swimming around your hooks and not getting caught, etc. Um, but for trawl surveys, the way that we do that is we would actually um, use a technique where you put a special type of bag, basically, and with a for a lack of a better word, around the end of the net. Um, to see how many fish usually would, would get through the net or go around the net. So we can see how many, absolutely how many are in the environment that we sampled at that point. But all of our surveys are also only twice a year. So we have to make assumptions about what that means for the rest of the year. And that's for, for financial reasons. You know, if we all had endless resources to do the science we wanted to do, we'd be out there every, every week um, surveying and seeing what's out there, but we simply can't do that. So there are ways, other ways that we observe the environment and also make assumptions about um, how fish are moving throughout the year to use those estimates we get from our surveys to understand those trends over time and ultimately develop um, those, those kind of um, targets for how many we should be extracting from the system. I hope that answered the question, but if I'm happy to um, elaborate for, with, for whoever asked the question at a later date as well. Yeah, if you, if you can add more to your, <clears throat> or refine your questions if you want. Um, here's a great question about your job. In your current position, is it mostly modeling or are you still getting out in the fields with the fishers or what do you do every day? Yeah, not so um, <laughs> during COVID. <laughs> Maybe a little not bit during COVID. Um, not, not during a pandemic. Not during a pandemic. Um, that's one of the things I like the most about my job is that I get to do something different every day. So for example, today I reviewed a proposal to do a research product project actually on the surveys that I was just describing to understand what we're missing, particularly for Atlantic cod. Um, so I got to read what they were proposing, think about whether that was the right technique to, to take and make recommendations about how to make that research better. On other days, I usually would go into the field. So I go to the field on our, our long line survey, I'll go out on our study fleet vessels, I'll spend time at the docks just talking to fishermen. Um, we do a lot of back and forth of just understanding what they're seeing. Um, so a lot of, you know, we, I still do do field work. Um, I do kind of, um, I have, you know, more conversations with a lot of the fishermen. Um, and I do do some modeling as well. I have a team that I work with where that has experts who are experts in the field and experts in the modeling realm and experts in cutting up fish, et cetera. Um, but I'm fortunate in my position um, being the lead of the program where I get to dip into each of them. Um, and it's something that I really enjoy about my work is I'm learning something new every day. People are teaching me new modeling techniques. I get to think about new ways to, to to sample fish, um, new analytical methods to use, new conversational techniques to use to get the information we want from fishermen. So my day is different every single day. Um, and that was the case during the pandemic as well. I just wasn't in the field. Um, so I am fortunate to still get to spend time in the field, but also um, have an ability to, to participate in all the different um, aspects of the research as well. Right, here is a question that I'm dying to know the answer to as well. Is there any push to develop a jellyfish fishery in the Gulf of Maine? Do you think there's any kind of market? Are them, are they, what do you think about Good that? Good question. Um, there is a global market for jellyfish. Yes, um, there is not a domestic market for jellyfish. So I guess my response would be, if there were a domestic market for jellyfish, as in a, when I say domestic mar market, I mean people requesting jellyfish in the state, in the US, um, I, the fishery would probably develop. Um, that's how fisheries grow, as people want to eat it. All right, let's go catch it. And let's make sure we're only catching enough to feed you and enough to leave in there so there's more of them in the future. There are many, there are jellyfish fisheries around the world. We just don't have them particularly due to demand um, or lack of demand here in the US. I don't see that coming down the pike anytime soon, quite honestly. People will barely eat 
a fish that's not a cod. <laughs> we got a ways to go to get to jellyfish, okay, um, but Ethan, maybe in I a couple think, decades. Ethan, that's your uh, mission here. Try to get people to eat jellyfish and then they'll be. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. This is an interesting question. We hear a lot about rogue fishing and overfishing around the world. How do you think cooperative fisheries practices in the U.S. affects the impact of unethical or illegal fishing? And is cooperative fishing and cooperative research popular elsewhere in the world? That's an excellent question. And I'm glad that you raised that. I often actually have a slide on illegal and, un and unreported fishing. Um, we are really fortunate here in the U.S. to have um, a lot of resources that are put into studying and managing our fisheries. Um, that is not the case in many other parts of the world. And there is um, rampant illegal and unreported fishing, fishing, particularly on the high seas, which is very difficult to manage. Um, and in other areas of the world, you're gonna get to meet my cat. This is Daisy, everyone say hi. <laughs> um, in terms of, does cooperative research play a role in combating illegal and, and unreported fishing? On the high seas and in the areas where it is most egregious and the biggest problem, that's a long ways off. What that, the first step towards battling IUU is enforcement, is knowing way, where it's happening and cracking down and making sure it doesn't happen and having consequences um, for illegal and unreported fishing. Same for slave la labor and, um, and there's been recent publicity about slave labor in some of the high seas fisheries as well, which is a major problem. But the only answer to that, the answer to that is not unfortunately cooperative research. Um, it is enforcement. It is enforcement and, and cracking down. That is the first step. There are other, however, throughout the rest of the world, there are other regions and countries where cooperative research is used. Um, it is, there are some countries where what's called, um, I'm going to forget the name of it, community managed fisheries, where it is, it is fishers working um, in partnership from the start, um, not necessarily with scientists, but with other people within their community to self-manage. So there are many different types of cooperative or collaborative research across the globe. Um, here in the U.S., it takes a little bit more of a formal form because it's not how we traditionally do research. You don't usually go out with a fisherman or ask a fisherman what they're seeing. You usually tell them what they're seeing and tell them what to catch because you know what they're seeing even though you might not. So that's why we, it's a little bit different here um, in the US and in the Northeast because it's not, it's a non-traditional way to do science. Whereas other parts of the world that is more traditional to use that approach because that's the way it's been done from the start. Um, next question is, are there any specialized trawls that you know of that would avoid bycatch on seals or sharks? Oh yeah, oh yeah, so there, there definitely are. Yes. Um, seals are fast enough to get out of most net, most nets. So I've been on many trawls where you'll see a seal go in and grab fish and come out and go in and grab fish and come out and then try to get in your boat, try to climb onto the deck to get the fish. <laughs> they are, can be aggressive. Um, so seals are not usually an issue for bycatch. Remember they're towing really slow. Usually when you're trawling, your boat can't pull that net. Think about the viscous force in the ocean. You can't pull that net very fat. Your boat has to be really strong to pull that net. So they're usually going really slow. So fast animals such as sharks or um, seals and others are not usually an issue for bycatch in bottom trawl fisheries. Um, there are techniques to avoid them, but primarily it's avoiding where they are. So it's techniques of you slow down. If you see a lot of um, dolphins or whatever it might be, you slow down until you see them pass and then you start back up. So that's not necessarily the gear, it's how, what you do when you recognize that they're in the area. Um, sharks as well, they might get caught in a net, but they almost always will just go right back into the water. If they see a shark, if a fisherman sees a shark in their net when it's coming in, they'll, they'll drop the bag. They'll trip, it's called trip the bag. They'll, they, the bottom of their net, they'll trip it, and open it up. So it just goes right back in. They don't want that thing on deck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't want to be sorting fish around a uh, around any shark um, that's, that's going to try to get them. But there are, okay. techniques. there are techniques. If any of you want to see a shark on the deck, you got to sign up for the shark class that's happening later in the summer. There's still some room in it, and they go shark fishing. 
Uh, last question, and this is a question about um, opportunities for students. Are there opportunities and who should they get in contact? This is very specific about cephalopods, octopus, squid, research, any work that you know about. Absolutely. So we have a lot of opportunities for internships at the Northeast Fishery Science Center. We actually have a whole web page that, that describes not just in the Northeast, but in NOAA Fisheries as a whole, all the different opportunities there are to get engaged. Um, many of them are summer programs, but there all are opportunities to engage throughout the year as well. Um, we are currently doing a lot of research on squid in particular, um, not an octopus. Octopus is in, is in a fishery out here. Um, gotta go to Alaska if you want to do octopus research. It's amazing though. They do really incredible research out um, in Alaska on doing cooperative research actually in the octopus fishery. Um, but we have a lot of internship programs. I'm happy to share some of those links um, with Jen and, and Colin after the fact as well. And if you're interested in you know anything that I've spoken to specifically, feel free to reach out to me um, via email as well. Next week, um... Chris Sidden is going to be on the island teaching the integrated ecosystem research and management class. And he is the director for fisheries for Alaska. So there's Perfect. There you go. everywhere people. He's a Shoals alum as well. So anyway, um, thank you so much. A lot of the students are putting in chat. Thank you. So we all appreciate your time and um, sharing your, your information and knowledge with us. So Excellent, we got through all the questions and that was great. So everyone know that we record these and we put them on the Shoals live stream page on our website. So if you wanna tell anyone to check out this talk or you wanna go back and look something up, um, you can find it there. Um, next week, June 17th at the same time is Dr. Lauren Devine. She is the director of the Ecosystem Conservation Office at the Aleut community of St. Paul Island, and that is in Alaska. And she will be talking about her position working for tribal governments in Alaska. This is very similar to what Anna's doing, and she's specifically working with tribal leaders on subsistence use, local knowledge, Western science, all the state and federal and tribal management of fish and other marine resources and stakeholder engagement. So another very cool integrated sort of uh, working directly with the users in this case, specifically tribes. So um, you can, if you're not a Shoals student, you can sign up on, or anyone can sign up on our website, shoalsmarinelaboratory.org. Thank you so much, Anna. Again, thanks everyone for joining us. Have an excellent night and we'll see you next time. Take care. Thanks, Anna. Thanks everyone.